the ministry. First, the ministry, you see him saying, don't tell anybody. End of the ministry, go tell everybody. All right? There was a time in the ministry of Jesus says, what has just happened to you is not for public pro proclamation. But you know people. <laughs> it doesn't always happen that way. In fact, some people say, why did, why did Jesus do this? Why, why did he tell him not to say anything? Well, some contend that Mark and the other gospel writers, you know, uh, inserted these commands for silence kind of as a, a, a device to explain why the Jews didn't recognize that Jesus was the Christ or Jesus was the Messiah. And I'm not really sure on that, but that view is, that view is called the, the Messianic Secret. And so it's kind of like Jesus didn't want it to be known at this point that he is the Messiah, so keep it a secret. Uh, then another idea is that the report that Jesus had just healed this man might prejudice the priest from verifying, pronouncing him clean. Now, why would it do that? Because a lot of the priests, as we saw last week, didn't like Jesus. In fact, it was their responsibility as the leaders of the spiritual, you know, uh, spiritual leaders of the nation, that if anybody came along and made a claim to Messiahship, that they were the Christ, then it was the responsibility of the, pri the priest to go out, just as it was over a leper pronouncing plenty, to say, yes, this man's a, the true deal, or this guy's an imposter. And that, there were a lot of imposters during the time of Christ, you know, just as there's still imposters today. People run around saying, I'm the Christ, or I'm God, or whatever. And so the responsibility was for them to declare. As we know from last week, many of these priests, they were too arrogant, and too selfish, didn't want anybody imposing upon their authority, so they just kind of shunned Jesus and didn't want anything to do with him all the way to the end of his ministry, even at the cross. You remember seeing them wagging their heads and spitting on Jesus, making claims for him to come down from the cross. So, lest there be a problem with this guy being pronounced clean, Jesus says, don't let anybody know I did this. A third reason comes the fact that Jesus didn't really want to be known primarily as a miracle worker. He was a miracle worker, but that wasn't the main reason Jesus came, to work physical miracles. The Jesus said, I've come to seek and save that which is lost. He made it clear that his ministry ultimately was to save sinners, to present his life as an offering for our sins. He knew exactly that one day he would die on a cross, all right? He was fully aware of that, and he says, that's the reason I came, because that's the only way that people are ever going to know a holy God, because men are not holy. Men are sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I, I, you know, I don't think we have to get a, a great revelation from God to realize that we sin, all right? So Jesus comes and begins to show by these performances of miracles that he is the Savior, that he is the Messiah, but at the same time, he don't want to get that in reverse. And people still reverse that today. Their big emphasis on miraculous events and to see a miracle of some sort and to have a great healing. Hey, God still does miracles, but that's secondary to the greatest miracle of all, and that's when Jesus Christ comes in and saves you and makes you a new person and forgives your sin. And the fourth thing here about why this secret was, this man's testimony it would possibly hasten the confrontation that was, that was going to happen anyway between the Jews, uh, between Jesus and the other religious leaders that we saw apparently ultimately bring about the crucifixion. And it was only going to be time for that when it was supposed to be time for it, and there shouldn't be anybody standing in the way. In fact, this man did go out, and the Scripture says he went out in verse 45 and began to publish it much. He uses the word in the King James too. It says it this way, to blaze abroad the matter. And what that literally means, instead of keeping quiet about it, he told anybody and everybody. He didn't just go out and say something. Literally, he put it, he, it's, when, to ablaze something means to set it on fire. He was like a, a forest fire on a windy day, making sure everybody knew how he had been healed. Now, you have to understand, this guy's been ostracized from society all his life, and we'll talk a little bit about that moment. So I would be kind of pumped up and excited too if Jesus has healed me of my leprosy. But he didn't keep quiet. He went out and told everybody he could tell. Anybody that would listen to him, he's telling it. He's blazing abroad the news. And as he does, people are coming from everywhere, all over the Galilee region, all over Capernaum, to find out and to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as a result of this man doing what he did, you see a lot of problems begin to result especially in the synagogue in Galilee and Capernaum where these things are taking place at this time. All right? So it's on, it's on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. 
Jesus has become very popular. This man going out, he has even made it more radically popular. It gets to the point when you study these early days of Jesus, he couldn't even enter into a town openly without in, in, you know, encountering some large crowd. You think the paparazzi is crazy today. Tens of thousands of people are coming to see Jesus. It's everywhere. In fact, the scriptures tell us another place in the New Testament, even when Jesus tried to retreat to a place where he could spend time with his father, he had to deal with the crowds even there. they just follow him anywhere and everywhere. But again, here's a man with leprosy. It's, it's a terrible disease. It was a, hard, it was a hard, lifelong illness. There was no known cure for leprosy. And many people looked upon it as some kind of divine judgment or some kind of divine you know, condemnation from God. In fact, the word in Hebrew for leprosy is the word sarath, and it means to smite or to strike. And, and it was, that word is used because most people would look at a leper and see, they would say, there's somebody who has displeased God and is under direct judgment by, by, by godly forces, all right? That they've been smitten, they've been hit with a stroke, so there's this judgment upon their life. And the, the lepers were pretty much the outcast of, of the culture. There really wasn't a lot of help for them from, from the culture. In fact, the Greek word is the word lepra, which we get the word leprosy from. And the, the Greek physician des, des, designated this as a disease that's caused from skin and scaliness of the skin. It was an awful disease. It was a terrible disease. Uh, and like I say, many people considered his punishment from the Lord. Second Kings chapter 5 and Second Chronicles with Miriam and Gehazi, you might remember that story, and Uzziah is smitten with leprosy. The disease begins with, uh, at least the ancient writers would tell us this, they, that they began with little specks upon the, the eyelids. That's where it would first begin to show up, and then it would gradually uh, go to the, to the palms. And from there, it would gradually spread over the whole body, ultimately bleaching your hair white and, where, and then crusting the affected parts where the scales would begin to come up. They'd begin to ooze and then they would crust over. There'd be terrible sores that would begin to be present all over the body, swelling, irritation, inflammation. The, the skin would be literally eaten up. And not only was it a surface kind of disease, after doing that to the outward parts of your body, the disease began to turn inward, ultimately rotting the whole body piecemeal. In the time of Jesus when this leper was out, no leper could live within a walled city. He could live in an open village, but he couldn't live in a walled city. But wherever he went, he had to dress a certain way, act a certain way. In fact, he had an outer garment that he had to wear that was torn. That was a symbol of his leprosy. He was required to go bareheaded, couldn't put anything over his head. He would be required to cover, if it's a man, his face and his beard with a mantle, as in, as in lamenting or as in grieving his own virtual death. If anybody came near him, a passerby, he had to call out loudly, unclean, unclean, so that they would avoid him, so they would not touch him. You couldn't speak to anyone if you were a leper. You were not allowed to speak to anyone. You couldn't receive or return a salute. How you do it? You couldn't say anything back, according to the law. Nothing that would spread the germ. Nothing that would, that would cause somebody else to become unclean. Especially you couldn't embrace anybody, and that was part of the salutation. As you came in, maybe somebody shook your hand or hugged you, patted you on the back. That would not be allowed whatsoever. So you could see how this leprosy would separate you from the culture and from the people. The only way you could survive if there was some family member or somebody with ministry heart that would bring you food to eat, all right, and leave you something out. The disease was highly contagious, as you can see from the, the way they had to be treated. It's evident from the regulations regarding this in the book of Leviticus and also in 2 Kings. But it was a bad disease. It was a terrible disease. And again, many people looked upon his punishment from God for some terrible sin that you had committed, being stricken by the, by the sovereign hand of God. But as you study the Word of God, as I said, there's a lot of symbolism in Scripture. And one thing that becomes very obvious about leprosy is the symbolism is clear in the Word of God. It points it out very clearly that leprosy is a type of and an outward visible sign of of a spiritual corruption that's going on in, in someone's life. It's a type, it's a picture, it's a symbol of sin and how sin works in somebody's heart. Now we know, I hope we know, maybe you don't, but the Bible says 
that everybody, because of Adam's sin against God, he corrupted humanity, and that everybody that is ever born into the human race comes in as a sinner. All right? We come in with this inborn capacity, with a corrupted nature, that we're selfish by nature, and we're sinners by nature. Now, you may be a benevolent person, that's mighty fine, but the idea here is that you're still a sinner. In fact, the Scripture makes it clear that all have, see, you know that, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, we kind of, like lepers, try to bandage ourselves up and put ourselves, put some white garments on or whatever we might try to do to hide that sin, but we're still born sinners. And the reason we don't have fellowship with God, and the reason we sense such an emptiness in our lives, the reason we search in so many different directions for happiness, for success, for peace, is because we are born sinners. It's just our nature. We're born without God. The Bible says that God loved us enough to send His only begotten Son to deal with our problem, amen? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God gave His Son so you could be cured of this spiritual leprosy that is in your life. The thing that separates you from God. Probably one of the greatest, uh, most miserable uh, situations that you would find yourself in as a leper is that if you were a person who loved God, you couldn't go to the synagogue. You couldn't have fellowship with God. And the same is true in spiritual leprosy. When we don't know Christ, we really can't have a relationship with God because we have this problem called sin. And it is unclean, and it is unholy, and God is clean, and God is holy. So we have this issue we have to deal with of leprosy. And it is interesting when you look at leprosy and how it operates and how it works, how how close it does relate to how sin works in our life. It just starts so small, doesn't it? As a child, you know, you, you want your will, you want your way, I want my ball, I'm going to go home, take my ball, go home, all those other things children do, you know, mine, mine, I, 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 it's my, it all belongs to me. You don't believe a baby's a sinner? Change that first diaper. <laughs> you new parents appreciate that, don't you? But it starts small. I mean, you know, the alcoholic, or the drug addict, the adulterer, whatever it might be out here, the immoral, they didn't begin that way. I mean, they had that in their hearts, but it just, I, I give up a little space here, give a little that, and pretty soon it consumes you and sin controls you and, and sin is taking over everything. But it just starts as a little place. That's why even as a Christian, Satan's always attempting to get you to give over some, God, oh, just a little thing. You're not as bad as so-and-so, and you're not getting drunk every, and all these things you might list, all those terrible things everybody does, you know, hey, By the way, let me tell you, you're not going to go to hell because you get drunk. You're not going to hell because you kill somebody. You're not going to go to hell because you rob somebody. You're not going to go to hell because you don't go to church. You're going to go to hell because you have a sin problem. And the only one who can solve that sin problem is Jesus. It's what we are more than what we do. Because we do what we do because we are what we are. You sin because you're a sinner. All right, dog barks, why? Because he's not a cat. (laughs) All right, he's a dog. So dogs, bow wow, all right? Cats meow. Because they are what they are. They do what they do. So we have to be changed internally, all right? But people, we don't understand this. What we do is say, I just won't do something. That's like that leper seeing that spot harm come upon his arm, just wraps it. But as soon as it begins to ooze and bleed, you have to wrap it some more. And it gets bigger and bigger, you wrap it some more. And you'll find out sometimes your biggest sinners are in church. (laughs) Trying to cover up with their religiosity, you know? And their good works. What only God can deal with in their heart, but their pride keeps them from coming to the place. Satan just starts small. But after that, from starting small, it starts spreading. Kind of like the vacuum cleaner salesman just wants to get his foot in the door so he can show you the vacuum, because he knows he can just show you a little more. He can can set the hook. Just get in. Just let me in the door. Let me show you how good this is, how great it is, how wonderful it's going to change your life. And this is the way way sin works in our life. It begins, we, we, we let it in, and even though we start resisting and fighting, you know, it starts spreading. It's like the guy who's got a drinking problem says, all right, I know I've got a drinking problem. I'm going to cut back. It just keeps spreading anyway. I'm going to cut back, but you don't. You say, well, I'm not going to drink on Monday or through Friday anymore. But you do. Because sin, like cancer, like leprosy, is never satisfied. We know the Bible makes it clear. It's fun to sin. Well, that's the Joe Arms translation. The real Bible translation says there's pleasure in sin for a season. It's fun to sin for a little while, 
Then what happens? Then it begins to consume, and then it begins to spread, and then it begins to take control, then it begins to disfigure. And how many people's lives have been so messed up, disfigured in a way from what God wanted in their lives, in their marriages, in their relationships, you know, in their home, with their parents, with their children, whatever it might be, on the job, with their career, with their future. Things begin just to be destroyed and to fall literally apart. You just can't find a place because sin doesn't ever give up and it never stops and you're not going to be able to control it. It just continues to destroy little by little by little by little, taking more and more and more. Ultimately, it renders us unable to enter the presence of God when we face death. Because there's the barrier. Can't enter God's presence now, and though I'm trying to be moral and decent and upright because I've got a problem. I'm unclean. I'm a sinner. And only Jesus can touch me at this point and change my life. The Bible makes it clear more than one place, over and over, without the shedding of blood, there's no removal of our sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross to take away this issue, to take away this, this sickness, this disease of sin in your life and make you a new person. Ultimately, it renders you unable to have any kind of relationship with God. As a Christian... Maybe you are a child of God. There was a time you made a real dedicated commitment of your life to Christ, but somewhere in this process, you began to justify what you were doing, rationalize your sin, make excuses for it, so to say. So now you're living kind of a pretend life. You're one thing at church, but in your private life, the secret life and the secrets of your life, you're completely something else different. What have you done? You've let something enter into your life that is slowly, little by little, gradually began to spread, ruining your relationships, ruining your life, taking you apart piece by piece, little by little, till you really can't even enjoy your time of fellowship with your father anymore. Can't go to prayer because you feel so guilty. And Satan is the condemner, so he just keeps heaping it in. He's got a great technique, doesn't he? It's kind of like, yeah, hey, man, this is great. You ought to try this. I got something you really ought to try and you, you don't want to miss this, man. This is good. You, yeah, everybody else is doing it, by the way. Hey, you, you're going to feel great. And come, come on, try this. Yeah, you, you, hey, there ain't nothing like this in the world. And you finally give in to that. And then he says something like this, if you're a child of God. I can't believe you did that. Yeah, <laughs> Look, you are so, so, you call yourself a believer. You are so worthless. Here, try some more. You don't want to hear this condemnation. So just deaden your senses a little bit more. So he's, you know, he's, he's been doing this a long time, by the way, folks, all right? You, you're a rookie. No matter, I don't care if you're 100 years old, you're still a rookie in regard to this whole issue. The beautiful thing here is this leper comes, and he sees Jesus, and he's already heard some of what the Lord does, and he approaches him, obviously with humility, he is a leper, all right? But he also approaches him with this measure of holy boldness, you know? And he says, Lord, you know, uh, can you heal me? I know you can if you will. I know you can, if you will. And, and that's pretty interesting because a lot of people believe that God can do something. They just don't know that God will do something. Sometimes it's easier to believe in God's power than it is His mercy. And some of you may be struggling there. You know that God can, but you need to realize that God is merciful and God will. I, I've known people, and I, I felt this way in my own life at times. You know, well, I'm just so far from God, I just don't know, you know, I, I don't deserve it. It's, never has it ever been an issue of you deserving it, lest you think you do, all right? It's always been an issue of mercy, and it's always been an issue of God's will. God does love you, and God does want to express His mercy. God does want to show His kindness. God does want to give you grace in your life, all right? But again, Satan is so subtle in his approach, he sometimes gets people to say, well, yeah, he can, but I don't know if he will. Well, he comes to Jesus, and in the proper Old Testament way, he's identified as a leper, and he's asking, and he, you know, basically he's acknowledging that you, Jesus, you have the right to refuse the prayer. I need mercy, if you will. Now, remember, the rabbis, the priests, they considered this leprosy to be an incurable disease. In fact, only twice, as I mentioned before, in the Old Testament, do we have God on record as cleansing a leper. All right? Uzziah and, and, uh, and uh, I mean, naming the leper. So we have the Lord working and cleansing people. But here's, here's the situation with this guy. Jesus is standing before him and he says, I believe you can do this. In fact, he has no doubt that God can do something in his life. He only whether, wondered whether Jesus was willing. Now, that's true for some of you here today, perhaps. And maybe others of you, it's not the matter of Jesus willing. We, you know he's willing. It's a matter of you being willing. 
You had not got to that part of being able to come to Jesus humbly and say, I have a need. My, I'm, you know, it's like me back in 1973. At the ripe old age of 21, I said, God, I am messed up. And I have messed up my life. I, I, I knew God could do something. I just need to get to the point where I had let him do it. And some of you may be able to say, well, I just don't deserve it. I just don't know if he can. He can and he will. This is his nature. It's within his desires, within his plan to change your heart, to change your life. And so what does Jesus do? He says, I will. And he touches him. And by the way, remember, he, you don't touch lepers, all right? You don't do that. Some of you have those little unwritten codes in your own mind. You don't talk to homeless people. You don't talk to drunks. Whatever that little rule might be in your mind, that's the rule and that's the cultural thing right here. You don't deal with him. You don't talk to him. You don't show him favor. You just ignore him. They might go away. But Jesus doesn't ignore anybody. And he's not ignoring you today. And he knows you. And he knows right where you're at. You may fool everybody else to think you have everything all together, but God knows what a mess you're in today. And you have to come to the place and say, Lord, if you will, I'm ready. I need you. I need you more than anything else in my life. I mean, Jesus, at this point, touches him. Remember, I don't know how old this guy is. The Bible doesn't say. But let's say he's 30 or 40 or 25. But for however many years it is, no one has ever touched him since this disease came upon him. Can you imagine that moment of power? The beauty of that moment when Jesus reaches down and he touches that. It says in verse 40, 40 it says, And Jesus was moved with compassion, and he put forth his hand, and he touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. What a beautiful moment. But what a beautiful moment it was in my life, in 1973, when Jesus said, I will. And reach down and touch my life. Some of you can remember that moment in time in your own life. If the so-called end of the rope or the beginning of Jesus and the beginning of the cross started, and you said, hey, I can't do a thing about this. By, by the way, this guy didn't sit back and say, oh, I'm a leper, I can't be clean. I've been a leper all my life. It's the only thing I know. I'm just a leper. Yes, people do that. Well, you know, that was my excuse for a few years. When God started dealing me, you know, I was about 18, 19. The Lord really started convicting me about where I was at in my life and getting my heart right with him. I, every time somebody talked to me about the Lord, I'd see a billboard or something, that little Holy Spirit start talking to you about stuff. And, and I would say stuff like, well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Have you ever say that? Uh, you know, I, I know, but I just, you know, I, I have to be true. True to who? True to myself. Oh, okay, I'm a sinner. But Jesus, remember this, it's not that he just forgives you what you do. He changes who you are. So any more, no more than the man could heal himself and now be declared clean can you of your sin. And so he does this miracle. He reaches down and he touches him and does this work in his heart and life. Now this, this is where it gets for us. Jesus here at the point, he touches the untouchable and he cures the incurable. Same way for you and I. And I think probably part of the problem for most of us is the same one I had for a long time. I just didn't want to see myself as a leper. You know? As a sinner. And I, I remember speaking to a close friend of mine right after I made a decision to give my life to Jesus. I, I went and told him, said, you know, I told him what I'd done. I said, you know, I just got tired of living the way I'm living. I, 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 I needed Jesus. My life was a mess. And he said, all right, Joe, you know, I guess that's all right. You know, I guess a cripple needs a crutch. I said, well, I wasn't crippled. What was wrong? I said, I was dead. I was dead in my sin, dead in my life, going nowhere, empty, lost, separated. I had nothing. And Jesus did a work in my life. It's not like I needed a crutch. It's not like I needed a road map somewhere. I needed a life change, and Jesus Christ is the only one. And here's what he says, I am willing. And by the way, in Scripture, that's the present tense. Right now, I am willing. And by the way, Jesus is called the eternal I am. Right now, where you're at, what you're facing, what you're dealing with, he's able. And he is willing to do something in your life, but you have to come to this place to willingly to be able to ask. He commands at this point, he says, be clean. And the same thing happens. So if you give your life to Christ, you don't have to be a hypocrite because he makes you new. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. How about you? That ever happened in your life? You ever come to the place of just saying, I'm... This is it. I need, I need God. Well, today could be the day for you. 
you need to make that decision. And by the way, nobody can make it for you, so quit worrying about what everybody else might say or do anyway. It's you. It's your life. It's your destiny. It's eternity. What will you do with Jesus? For believers in this room today, if there is this leprosy been popping up in your spiritual life, it's you making a decision to get that right, come clean with God so that he might cleanse you. The Bible says, God said, be clean, and it was immediate, it was complete, and it was visible, which is what God does in our life. He does it in the moment. It's thorough, and it begins to become visible in our life. The other option is keep wrapping yourself with dirty rags. That's the illustration that Paul used when he talked about our best. Paul, Paul in, 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 this, in the New Testament was talking about how we try to use religion instead of get right with God. We have our own righteousness. And he says that our righteousness, self-righteousness, the, the words in the English Bible are as filthy rags. Now those filthy rags that he's referring to, everybody knew what they were. They were the rags that the lepers used. And they would be discarded in places when the pus and the sores would break and burst and the things would ooze and filthy disease. They'd take those nasty cloths off and they'd drop them aside and they'd redress the wounds. And what Paul was saying, you see those filthy, disease-filled rags? Compared to God, that's us. And only one can make us clean. And that's him. And I thank God from the bottom of my soul today. So back when Joe Arms got on his knees before God and said, I, I'm sick of living this way. Be clean. Turn your heart to Christ and see what God did. He has still the power to forgive. And I think that's a simple lesson really too today. One, Jesus still has the power to forgive if we'll let him. And I think the second lesson is we shouldn't be afraid if we are believers to touch people's lives to speak to people, to care for people, to put our arms around and help people, to point people to the cross, to tell people about Christ. We should never be afraid to do that. We're living in a world of isolation. We cut people off. We build walls around our life. We don't want to deal with anybody we don't have to deal with. We go home. We forget about the world. We turn on our TVs, and we don't even relate to each other. Everybody sits around at the dinner table with their iPods and iPads and iPhones and texting, and, you know, and, but there's no real com contact anymore in the culture we're living in, and it's becoming more so every day. It's time for the church to rise up and be what God's called us to be and start touching lives again. Speaking to people, caring about people, putting arms around people, helping people, making a difference in people's lives. That's the Jesus we serve, willing to touch the untouchable. I pray and hope that's your life. I pray that these things like we do as a church, like this evangelism explosion class, if you know you need to be in there, you haven't signed up yet, you'll take that form out of the bulletin and sign up today. Or at least say, I need to ask some questions about it and get your name on that list so we can contact you. Because God's called us all not to isolate ourselves, not to hide in little spiritual caves somewhere, but to make a difference. And we do that with our mouths, with our hands, our hearts. Would you stand with your heads bowed this morning? This morning, I believe that the Lord's... Uh...